My name is uh, Charles Small. I'm Senior Associate uh, Athletics Director, and, and welcome everybody. We're really excited, um, obviously, for the iScore Conference, but also to be a part of the iScore Conference. Uh, we have a group of student athletes who are here to share their experience. Um, and so, first, I do want to thank our student athletes for um, your willingness to participate and, and, and share your experiences. I also want to thank uh, Lindsay Long and Joanna Beaton and our student athlete and letter winner engagement uh, program for your leadership in helping uh, with this with this discussion panel. In terms of the format, we'll have a uh, a discussion panel for the majority of the, our time here. Uh, we'll also end uh, with some questions uh, for the audience. Um, and to start, you know, we'll, we'll start by uh, introducing our, our panelists. So um, we'll go through each of the panelists. I'll, I'll do a brief introduction. And for our panelists, if you can share um, why you chose ISU, um, or you can uh, give your favorite quote, you all decide. First up, we have Elena Campbell. She's on our, our women's uh, golf team. She's a junior, um, and she is a supply chain uh, management major, um, and she's from New Zealand. I chose Iowa State because it's a pretty awesome place, of course. Um, there's some um, New Zealanders and Australians that have previously been on the men's golf team, um, and there's an Australian on the um, women's team now. Um, she's a senior. So that was a real draw factor for me here, um, knowing I, it's sort of like a home away from home, which was very exciting for me. Um, our facilities are some of the best in the country, um, which some of you probably don't realize, but it's, it's pretty awesome. Um, 750 yards of just golfer's paradise, so that's um, very cool. And um, being so central, we get to travel to east and west coast, so um, sort of get the real experience coming from um, the other side of the world. So yeah, very lucky to be here. Next up, Greg Eisworth II. Uh, he's a member of our, our football team. He's a, a senior student athlete, major in kinesiology and health with a minor in psychology. Um, and his hometown is Grand Prairie, Texas. So for my introduction, I decided to do a favorite quote. The quote that I chose is, it is not he who has little, but he who wants more who is poor. So um, when I first seen the quote, it just kind of struck me. I think it's something that I can relate to. Um, I'm a firm believer in being happy with what you have, making do with what you got. Um, you know, oftentimes in society, it's easy to compare yourself to others, want something that somebody else has, or not accept yourself for who you are. Um, and in the midst of that, you get lost and you forget the things that you do have. You sometimes skip the blessings that you have. So. For me, it's being content with what you have. And um, I think some of the richest people are the people who do that, who are happy with what they have, who um, can spread love in that way and not constantly comparing themselves to others. So that's the quote that I chose, just a little insight on who I am. All right. Thank you, Greg. All right, Taven Hayes is next. And uh, she's a member of our, our soccer team. Um, Taven is a junior. Her major is uh, communication. She's minor in public relations, and she's from Henderson, uh, Nevada. Hi, guys. I'm Taven. Um, so I just knew before leaving my official visit that it was going to be completely impossible to find a place that Iowa State, the, that Iowa State made me feel. I knew that the next visit that I had planned, I already had canceled it because I was like, this is where I belong. This is my home. And being so far away from home, I was lucky enough to find a place where people made me feel like I belonged and I felt as welcome as I did by my faculty and the fans and teammates. So. All right, thanks, Taven. And next on the line is Candelera Herrera. Uh, she is a junior on our women's volleyball team, kinesiology major, and from San Juan, Argentina. Hello. Um, so my quote I choose was, remember who you are is uh, how you take your power back. So this quote, little, little bit remember me to stay true to myself. And then uh, in those moments where I feel overwhelmed or stressed because I, I feel I'm not performing well as an athlete or as a student, um, just, uh, just look back to myself and reflect and encourage myself to just don't let this type of moment uh, characterize me as a person I am and, and the purpose and of my journey in Iowa State. And next up, we have uh, Mason Way Jr. Uh, he's a member of our, our track team, and they just recently won the uh, Big 12 
uh, indoor conference champions. So congratulations, Mason. <laughs> Uh, was a big part, <laughs> thank, thank played a big, big role in that victory. Um, and, and as you can see, Mason's a senior uh, liberal, liberal studies major uh, with a business minor, and he's from Upper Derby, Pennsylvania. Yes, hello. Um, it's nice to meet you all. I decided to do a quote from my um, insight today. Um, it says, I fear not the man who has practiced 10 kicks 10,000 times. I mean, once, but I fear the man who has practiced one kick 10,000 times, and it's by Bruce Lee. And this quote basically kind of talks about my um, trials and tribulations throughout my entire life up to this point at Iowa State, basically. And so it's just me trying and error, trying and error, trying to um, make the best out of, a, you know, any bad situation, things like that. All right, thank you. So now that you have uh, been introduced to our panelists, you know, I, I really think one of the themes that will come out uh, today is this idea that our student athletes come from different walks of life, have different backgrounds, um, but there are some commonalities as, as being a cyclone and being a student athlete, um, some, uh, some common experiences, but there is a lot of differences in diversity within our group. Um, I'm reminded of that when uh, we had our fall um, student athlete graduates uh, ceremony. Um, during the fall, we had 22 graduates, um, and they came from four different countries, uh, 10 different states. And, um, and you just see kind of this, even with those 22 student athletes, just those different walks of life. Um, and they, they also had um, this, this drive and, and, and willingness to be involved in the community. So that group were involved with 10,000 hours. When you, when you think of that class, 10, over 10,000 hours of, of service um, while their time here. And you look at the impact. Um, from an economic standpoint, over $279,000 uh, of community impact and really excelling at a high level. Uh, we had two uh, Big 12 Conference Scholar Athletes of the Year within their sport, Thomas Pollard from track and Sammy uh, Williams from, from softball. So just really showing uh, that our student athletes come from different walks of life, um, have these commonalities, but they're, and they're also performing at a very uh, high level. I want to um, show a video, um, really high level, day in the life of a student athlete, and then we're really going to dive in and drill down to our, our panelists and uh, their experiences, but want to give you all some context um, at the macro level. and get ready for my class and here's Brooke. <laughs> I have my math recitation, which is where I'm gonna take the quiz in Calc at 11 o'clock. So I'm gonna study a little bit before I go and Jenna's gonna take me and drop me off. <laughs> so I came in as an industrial engineer. I picked that during orientation. My schedule was really, really hard and I also like went to a career fair and um, a dinner with engineers and I just did not really feel like that's where I belong so I dropped my engineering course just because I felt like I didn't have the time that I needed to like complete and study as long as I needed to. Now next semester I'm doing environmental science so that's a pretty big change. And we're headed to my calculus recitation for engineers so it's pretty hard, pretty hard class but I'm gonna push through it. Coming. Okay. 
It's like 12.30, me and my friends just got done eating lunch at Seasons, and me and Jenna are gonna go back to the dorm, study for chem, and then we're going to probably take a nap, and then we're gonna get ready to go to the airport. And I'm gonna take a nap. I'm going to my chem recitation now. I'm gonna ride my bike, because there's no buses that go over there. Here we go. All right, we're walking up to the airport. Everyone say hey. <laughs> Thanks, Kanda. Yay. Here we are. Day in the life of a student athlete, and obviously um, it depends on uh, the time of the year. Um, we have in season, out of season. Um, there are different commitments. On the on the screen, we have um, a football kind of typical um, time requirements, uh, whether versus in season uh, in the fall, um, and then as you transition to to out of season, it's kind of two parts. Um, so you see in the fall, you obviously have class, you, you have um, the, the competition in, on, on Fridays and Saturdays, or Fridays travel, Saturday games, um, and then the spring is broken up into two different sections, and then you also have summer uh, commitments. Well, Greg's on our, our football team, and just kind of describe your engagement with activities outside of football. We have the schedule and, and know how, many, how much time commitments are with football. Talk about your um, activities outside of football. Yeah. Um for me personally, I like getting around my teammates, uh, just them coming to my place, I'm going to theirs. And with that, if you put about five to ten football guys in a room, um, something will happen. You make something out of nothing. Because uh, honestly, there's not a whole lot to do in Ames, Iowa, if I'm being honest. So um, within that, you find a lot about each other. You bond. Uh, you notice that some can sing or play an instrument. Some try to sing, can't really sing. But, you know, like last year we went Christmas caroling or we were just driving out in Des Moines and found, well, it might not have been Des Moines. Honestly, I have trouble with all these cities. Um, but we stumbled across like a man-made beach and we just spent the day out there uh, last summer. Um, I remember like we had a huge water balloon fight one time. Like really just any random thing that we can do. Um, we love doing that. We love bonding as a team. and. Um, Outside of just activities for fun, our team chaplain, uh, RJ, he like encourages us a lot to do just some type of fellowship outside of the facility. So like right now I'm in like a small Bible study group. We meet once a week. That's good. It's always good to just push each other in that aspect. And um, also the football program does a really good job of providing us with community service opportunities. So usually about once a week we'll get a text message about an opportunity that we have um, to do community service somewhere, and we just sign up, and um, they'll give us a time and place, and we'll meet them there. So those are really the main three activities or types of activities that I do, um, being that we don't have a lot of time because our schedule is pretty busy, but, like, you know, spring kind of lines up, and summer we have a little bit more time as well. So. Thanks, Greg, for sharing. Uh, the next slide is kind of showing a travel schedule uh, for our, our women's golf team, and um, you see there's a lot of, a lot of competition um, away from campus and a lot of travel. So, Elena, can you talk about how you manage uh, to set, excel academically uh, with the time demands of participating in athletics? Yeah, um, so I sort of went through this a little bit and I figured out that basically we're away for 42 days of the semester. So that's like over a month and it, it gets quite overwhelming sometimes. But um, we're very lucky to have the support of um, our academic um, Counselors and counselors, yep. and um, having resources such as tutors and mentors. Um, one thing that has been big for me over the last year and a bit is that um, you can only do what you can do at the end of the day, just sort of prioritizing, like I've got a spare hour here, how am I going to use this hour, um, and then put that to the side and then move on to something else um, that's quite important, um, I have felt over the last little while. Um, coaches still want us to perform as well. That's the, the hard juggling act there. So you're sort of, 
at practice and you know you've got a whole lot of homework to get done, but worrying about your homework at practice, like that's not going to get you anywhere basically. So I guess it's about um, splitting up these times and realising there is a time to get your schoolwork done and there is a time for golf and that's, um, it all balances out eventually. Um, and I also feel that um, we don't get a lot of time on the road to do things. So um, if we've got an 8 a.m. tea time one day, it'll be 5.45 up at the golf course basically till three o'clock in the afternoon. And then we get home, we've got to do stats. I'm not, you know, you don't want to sit there and do hours of homework. So getting it all done before we travel is a very important thing for us to be able to manage all our time well. And um, in many sense for all of us somewhat, it's what we've done and it's, it's what we know. I've spent a lot of time at high school. I spent, I think it was seven out of 12 weeks away um, out of a term just for my golfing. So I guess it's somewhat all what we know and, and that's what it is. So that helps as well, I guess. Um, and so with those demands, you know, and I, I mentioned a little earlier, our student athletes do excel um, academically. Just wanted to share uh, some stats with you. Uh, when you look at our graduation rates, the NCAA has a graduation success rate, so it doesn't um, account for, for transfer like the federal rate. Uh, we have a 91% uh, graduation success rate among our student athletes. Uh, when we look at campus and, and our graduation uh, rates and, and compare them, our student athletes are at 70% for the federal graduation rate. Um, the campus graduation rate is 75%. If you look at GPAs, um, just some of the comparisons um, for our female student athletes, they have a 3.38, uh, campus has a 3.32. Um, the males have a 2.99 for student athletes and uh, campus has a 2.97. Um, and if you look at minority student athlete uh, GPAs, uh, student athletes have a 2.82 uh, and, and campus has a 2.83. Um, just uh, GPAs uh, from a cumulative standpoint, our student athletes have a 3.17, uh, while campus has a 3.11. Um, and then for the, um, for the fall semester, there was a 3.16 um, GPA and campus was a 3.08. Uh, some other stats to throw out, 39% of the student, our student athletes were on the dean's list, 34% uh, on, on campus for undergrad, 63% uh, of our student athletes had a 3.0 or higher um, and 62% um, on campus. So you see kind of the, the demands, um, but our student athletes are able to utilize their support and resources to still uh, excel um, academically. One of the uh, programs we had in the, the fall semester was a student athlete career fair. Um, and at our career fair, we had 25 companies. Um, a lot of times with travel, student athletes may not be able to attend uh, some of the career fairs that are, that are offered through the colleges. So we um, offer this opportunity. And uh, Taven actually attended our career fair. So can you uh, um, kind of share your experience um, and talk about um, and talk about your experience at the uh, career fair this past fall? Yeah, so you know, being a student athlete, we don't always get the chance to attend the school health career fairs. So it was really special for us to be able to have a specific student athlete career fair that we could attend. It was later at night, so that was helpful. So all of us could get there. Um, it was my very first career fair. And even though I did a lot of preparation, um, it still was nerve wracking. But out of it, I did connect with great people and I did um, secure an internship for the first time, so it was really important that I got this opportunity um, by the staff that um, like got this event together because without it, I wouldn't have that internship. And you know, as student athletes, we really worry about not having jobs or um, internships, so that way, when we go into our first real job, that we can say we had that experience. So, getting this opportunity to attend this like. Cyclone Athlete Career Fair was very helpful and it was great.
It's very helpful for myself and the other student athletes because in my uh, major, the engineering career fair, they happened exactly the same time that we had practice, and there were two dates, and I couldn't make it to either one of them. So getting an opportunity like this to meet with companies is awesome. I really enjoyed coming to this internship fair. I think we are very fortunate to have this opportunity and getting comfortable in front of all these businesses and getting the experience in order to talk in front of businesses and get that comfortable feeling I think has really helped and I think it's amazing that we get to do this. Through some of the discussions we, we, we had uh, with our student athletes on the panel, um, you talked a lot about kind of life lessons uh, learned and, and how sport influences you uh, through those life lessons. Candelera, can you um, kind of talk about the transferable skills that you've learned uh, through sport? Uh, okay, so becoming a student athlete, uh, I would say I have learned a lot of skills. One of them uh, was organizational skills, then leadership and decision making. Uh, starting with organizational skills, I am through just being a student athlete and had a lot of demands in a being in a school and also uh, sports. I had to figure out how to be more organized so in order to be successful in both areas. Then uh, just becoming a a type of leader, a leader in my team just coming for to a complete new team where I'm not speaking very well English. I have to don't be the leader that speaks a lot, but be the leader like just encourage my teammates, showing them uh, just a positive attitude and good body language as well as, as, well as uh, work ethic and hard work. And finally, uh, decision making because in the process to um, in the process to, of like uh, achieving your dreams and goals, uh, you gotta set them. And then then the decision making, uh, it's uh, I figure out that they, it's so important because uh, from that you are gonna get stronger in your discipline and in the strength of execution of, of tasks. To, in order to achieve your goals. We'll ask Greg a, a, a similar question. And, um, you know, Greg is actually a transfer student athlete, transferred from, from Ole Miss, uh, went to a junior college, and then uh, landed at Iowa State University. So, Greg, what was it like coming to a, a program as a transfer student athlete and, and talk about adapting? Yeah, so I'll kind of start with just my journey and why I chose Iowa State. Um, so yeah, I was originally at Ole Miss. Uh, I had a kind of a chronic injury that I felt like really wasn't being treated the right way. And I just felt like I didn't fit in with the culture there, necessarily how players interacted with each other or with the coach. So um, I left after a year, went to junior college, kind of rehabbed and played a year at junior college. And because of that, I was able to get re-recruited. So second time around getting recruited, I knew exactly what I was looking for. I had the opportunity to maybe change a mistake that I made in the first place. Um, so I was looking for a place where I knew I fit in with the people um, because that's the most important thing. It's not really the facilities or the cool jerseys or maybe the wins and loss records, but it's more about the people that you're with because that's where you spend the most time. You're going to get tired of seeing the facility. Um, the locker room's not going to be as cool anymore. So um, it, for me, it was about the people and the coaching staff. And um, came here and I, I loved it. And I absolutely knew that this was a place for me to be at. And 
because of the people, because that being the reason that I chose Iowa State, the transition was pretty easy. Um, you know, it, it's always different at first. You're just trying to get to know the people on the team, get to know how things work here. But the support that I had from coaches and players was awesome, and it made that transition smooth. Um, when I came in, you know, we were working on building a culture is what Coach Campbell speaks on. Um, and just the culture is how we interact, the standards that we believe in and as a team. And one of the, the main points of our culture is having a player-led program, which is basically where instead of the coach having to hold all the players accountable for their actions, the players hold each other accountable for their actions. Um, and to me, that just breeds maturity and growth because you know, when a coach is yelling at you for doing something wrong or having to correct you for your mistake, a lot of students or athletes take it as, oh, the coach is picking on me or that's just the coach's rules and that's what he wants. And, but if you have a, an upperclassman who has played, who has been successful, and he's cleaning up the locker room or he's um, handling himself this way, then it makes it easier for younger players to fall in line. And so... Um, that's been awesome for me, coming in, building onto that culture, kind of solidifying that culture. Um, so because of that, my transition has been awesome. Uh, I've been able to grow in many aspects, mature in many aspects, and you know I wouldn't change it for the world. Taven, we'll, we'll go uh, to you. Can you talk about how, how has being a student athlete prepared you for, for life after college? Yeah, so I think uh, a big role that student athletes have to play is Having those, even though we do have those hard days and life gets tough, I think we already have instilled in us that we have to wake up the next morning and bring that leadership that we want to the team. I think a large majority of people, when they wake up and they have to go to work and they dread it, I think they have to still get through that work day and they still have to communicate with their employees. And I think as student athletes, we don't necessarily get the luxury of just being quiet or not talking to our teammates because we still have to do those things. So I think being a student athlete has prepared me for life after college because I do have all those skills that I can transfer to the outside world. And I think as a student athlete, we have to hold ourselves to a higher standard because we have young kids that look up to us and we have to maintain that, um, that that standard that we have set for ourselves and that our teammates have set for us. So I think that has prepared me largely for life after college. You know, obviously in today's society, we think about social media um, and, you know, I, I'm not really good at math, but I'll give you a couple of quick numbers uh, real quick. So if you look at our panel today, I did, did the, the math real quickly, and you looked at the followers of our people on our panel, um, there's 16,425 followers on Instagram represented on this panel. Now, Greg doesn't have an Instagram account, right? So you have to take that into account. And, uh, oh, you have people clapping. And so if you do the math, right, and we have 450 student athletes, and you multiply the six, 16,000 by 90, um, that's 1,478,000 followers. Now that doesn't, you know, that doesn't include some of the the outliers like Greg's teammate Brock Purdy or your T Tyrese Halliburton's on basketball. So I don't know where that number is, but the idea is that our student athletes have a platform um, and they have a, a range in terms of reach and influence. And and oftentimes there's a lot of responsibility uh, that comes with that with that platform. For this next section, we want to kind of talk about uh, some of the responsibilities of being a student athlete, and we'll go to Elena. Um, and so, you know, oftentimes we think of student athletes as ambassadors of the university or representatives of the university. Uh, Malena, how have you embraced uh, really being a representative or an ambassador of the university? Um, well, I think coming to a school like Iowa State, um, it's such a cool place that it's hard not to want to be a good ambassador. So I feel in that sense, um, it's very lucky. Um, I believe I could recruit anyone to Iowa State from no matter what team they're on or anything like that. So I, I feel like I'm, it's, you know, sometimes just naturally there for um, us to do. Um, 
I think being a part of something bigger than ourselves is a really important thing. Like golf, such an individual sport, um, but having the team aspect and knowing it that you're actually doing it for your teammates, it's not just for yourself. I feel that's um, very important in establishing like a community um, just outside of my team necessarily, but everyone around us. Um, it's pretty cool. Um, also, giving back um, through things such as volunteering. Um, as in the couple of photos there, one day we went um, delivering cookies to um, the firemen and the police department. So I love having opportunities like that to um, give back to people that give so much to us. And I went and read um, books to some kids the other day at a school. And it's just so much fun to um, see the joy in their faces and how we can sort of change their lives and um, just by simply going in and reading a book to them. So um, that's, that's pretty awesome. And I feel one more thing on that, um, having such a responsibility, especially throughout campus um, with different professors and whatnot, um, we have quite a platform that we use, traveling and, and things like that. So I feel if one student athlete comes along to a professor and sort of does something that maybe necessarily they shouldn't have done or made some bad decision with that professor, um, that can sort of jeopardize other future student athletes going through there. So I, I feel it's very important for um, us to be respectful for everyone and everyone else behind us and use the platform um, wisely and really just take um, advantage of all the opportunities we we get given. So, yeah. That's awesome. And so you, Elena kind of spoke about her experiences and responsibility and some of that involved community service. Um, Mason is um, also in, is involved in the community. Um, but Mason, can you also kind of talk about uh, your experience even back at home in Philadelphia and some of the uh, initiatives that you participated in? Uh, yes. Um, whenever I go back home, I tend to visit my schools, um, my high schools, my middle schools, to kind of talk to the youth about um, what it takes to get to this level. Um, being able to grow up in an environment where sometimes you, you don't have the resources that you need to um, be able to get here at a division one level and you don't have the support that you need. Um, so um, I usually talk to them about, you know, having good grades, um, being able to be perseverant, stay consistent, be persistent with everything that you do. Um, and so just having that, that aspect to go back and give back to my community and just have people that's looking up to me and kind of showing the path that if I can make it here, you guys can make it here as well. It's kind of like a big thing for me and just kind of painting the picture in their head to give them, you know, something to look forward to, basically. I want to share a uh, quick video clip of an international initiative that our student athletes participate in called Souls for Souls. opportunities that our student athletes have to, to, to select a uh, country outside of the United States and, and do service. Um, also, sometimes our teams travel for competition. They go to, to uh, different countries for competitions um, during the summer. Um, and Candelaria had an opportunity with the women's volleyball team to actually go back home uh, to Argentina. And so, Candelaria, can you uh, share a little bit about that experience? Yes, um, ICU Volleyball travel uh, every four years to make an international trip. So this last year, my coach having a lot of places and wonderful 
much nicer than Argentina. So she she choose go to to meet my family and back home and just see where I come from. Uh, she always say she was very excited as well as my teammates uh, to go back home and just be around my family. Uh, this meant so much for me because just thinking that it's so hard for my family just come here and and watch me play and just be around uh, here and with my teammates. So and after before that it was just like just letting them know like how practice games went. Um, as well as school. So for my family, just actually see me play with the ISU jersey with my teammates was such a great experience and they will never forget as well as me. And then, um, so uh, just see as well, I mean, was very emotional for me and just remember the memories that that unique experience had led me just like sharing with my coaches, teammates, and my family, all of us together uh, in my back home. So it's just an unforgettable and unique experience I will never forget. And I will, I will always be forever thankful to Iowa State that give me the opportunity to live. Greg, um, and so we, I mean, we were talking about social media originally, but obviously there's other aspects in terms of responsibility, in terms of uh, actual media uh, responsibilities. So, Greg, can you kind of talk about how you uh, prepare for for interviews and um, and go through that process? Okay. Um, if I'm being honest, I actually don't prepare for interviews at all. <laughs> um, I really just focus on being myself. Um, there's already a lot of pressure based off of how you played or performed. There's all this added pressure. So, why add more pressure on myself to answer a question the way that they want me to answer it. Instead, I'll just be myself and that's what you'll get. You know, I've never had any issues with telling somebody I'd rather not answer that question or no comment or, you know, so I don't really prepare. I honestly forget. Like Mondays, usually during the season is when like our interview days. They interview us leading up to that week about our opponent and I actually forget until they call me in that Monday like, hey, come do this interview. It's like, all right, well, what you see is what you're going to get. So um, um, that's really my approach to um, media and interviews, honestly. And as a, as a follow-up, how do you use your, your platform uh, to send a positive message? Um, I, think it all, I think it all just circles back to being who I am. Um, and I think it just goes back to being my genuine self, um, coming from the heart, not trying to be anybody else or do anything else. Um, just appreciating where I'm at um, and letting that kind of radiate throughout myself. Uh, I'm a big people person. I love getting around people, making them laugh, um, getting to know people. So that's kind of my positive message or vibe that I give off. Um, I don't really have social media. Um, it doesn't make me lame. I'm still like, I'm just as fun as everybody else without it. Um, but that whole thing was just, I wanted to kind of challenge myself. It's easy to, you know, any idle time that you have, just pick up your phone and scroll through social media. And I noticed that. And, you know, you can delete the app. And then, but when you want to get back on, you're just going to redownload it. Or you can put the little block on it for an hour. But when you click back on it, it'll say, do you want to unlock the app? And then you can unlock it. So those things don't really work. So I just decided to delete everything that I had, kind of like an experiment, see how I would feel, where I'd go from there. And I think I learned a lot. Um, you kind of subconsciously compare yourself to others when you're on social media. You know, it's all about how many likes can you get. Well, instead of being who you are and the people that accept you for who you are, those are the people that will come into your life and then those will be the right people that you need in your life because you're being yourself you're not trying to be anybody else um, you know it's easy to you start reading all these things and to fall into these norms just because that's what everybody else is doing and um, you know so without it you kind of take a step back and you're able to grow on yourself grow on your own and form your own opinions and really just mature from it and you know I'm not opposed to social media I just think that from this I've learned a lot and 
you know, I mean, I could get back on social media whenever I wanted to. Like I said, I'm not opposed to it, but I think just knowing the positives and negatives that can come from it and knowing how to manage your social media accounts and, um, you know, just send off that positive message like you're talking about. So, Well, can we give our uh, panelists a, a round of applause for um, sharing? Um, really appreciate that. Um, we have we have around ten minutes, nine, nine minutes to be exact. You know, we can open it up to any questions that the uh, audience may have. Um, thank you for sharing your experiences. It sounds like you're having really great, um, positive experiences, student athletes on this campus. What I want to know is, do you feel welcomed by the greater community, and have any of you experienced discrimination from faculty, staff, or other students based on your identity as a student athlete? I love the community here. I think um, everybody loves Iowa State. Um, because there's not a whole lot to do out here. So um, <laughs> I'll say that again. Um, and that's awesome. Like I said, I'm a people person. So um, I personally haven't found or felt any discrimination in any way. You know, I, I openly talk about my faith, and um, that's something that we're big on, uh, the friends that I hang out with. And I've been supported in that aspect. Uh, we actually had um, 10 guys about month ago get baptized in our facility so you know those kinds of things it's it's not there's no discrimination it's I feel like it's celebrated here and that's part of my identity or that is my identity so I haven't felt any of that in any way shape or form and I absolutely love the community here one of you all have already touched on activities outside of um, Iowa State things or like cyclone related activities um, but obviously like people have identities like people are well-rounded, so like you have multiple factors to yourself. So do you guys ever find it challenging or difficult to figure out spaces or times to embrace those other aspects of yourself outside of your uniforms, outside of like all of your cyclone obligations? Because I feel like there's only 24 hours in a day and it doesn't really seem like I'll get to be human every once in a while. So how do you guys navigate that? Um, in terms of like time management as a student athlete, um, it's kind of it's kind of tight, but we always try to find ways to you know just try to have fun. Um, I was a a part of the Psy Factor here, and basically it's like a talent show, and you just go in, um, you perform, try out, and try to make addition and things like that. And I actually sang and played the piano. Um, I did that right after practice. Literally, I got from practice. <laughs> I ran all the way here to um, the MU, and I'm like singing. Everybody's like, you, you see an athlete? I'm like, yeah. Uh, my friends, they, they dragged me in here. They told me I was good, so I just came out here and started, you know, singing and stuff like that. Um, after that, I mean, there are other activities here on campus, too, that are groups, organizations that I've been a part of as well. Um, even though it's kind of tight, it's just like, you know, you find things that, you, t you find time for things that are important to you. So just like how we think sports is important, academic is important, we always make time and you know try to fit in, it, fit in our schedule, basically. I'm just curious to know if you have a lot of time to actually interact with the other students uh, in the uh, Iowa State community, and if that's um, a welcoming situation for you. Um, I, there, there actually isn't much time in our day to um, do things like that. Um, when it comes to like doing group activities or um, meeting people in class, for example, um, like as you said, so my travel schedule is crazy as, so you go into the start of the semester and you find a seat and then the next class you might be gone, so then you actually don't get to make those interactions like everyone else um, gets to do so you sort of everyone starts moving around and it's like oh where's where's so and so gone they're not there anymore so I guess it's um, kind of hard in that sense but I think as Mason said um, you find time to do these things if you want to um, sort of make friends doing I don't know in the extracurricular type of thing you can make time to do these things and um, yeah, I feel like there is opportunity. You've just got to figure out when to do it. And I mean, students are really um, forthcoming with us and I go to different people for notes and whatnot. And I feel like ways through that, you're able to make interactions with people and um, yeah, keep up um, good friendships and relationships. So yeah. Go ahead, Mason. Um, just to add on to what she said, um, I'm kind of like a friendly guy in my classes. I try to talk to a lot of people in my classes, make friends. Uh, 
in terms of like you know talking to have making relationship with other people and things like that and forming relationships um I've met people from different backgrounds um, to try to understand their ethnic, you know, backgrounds, to try to understand who they are as a person. So I don't go around being ignorant to, you know, certain ideas and religions and all kinds of stuff like that. And so um, my relationship has grown stronger with other people here on campus. Um, I always try to take the time to say hello to somebody. Even if I don't know you, I always try to say hello. Um, I went to Walmart one time and I met this elderly lady and she just, she just, she was really adorable and she was just like, <laughs> She somehow she knew me. Um, I'm guessing you know I'm a student athlete here, but she just she said hey to me. I helped her out with certain things, and we laughed about it. She asked me about my day, and I asked her about her day too. It's just the little things that kind of you know make a difference in having that relationship here. Um, at Iowa State was really good too as well. So that was the experience that I had too. I'm a faculty member here, and I'm just curious, what are some of the things that your professors do to support you, or what are some of the things that you would like your professors to do more of? Um, yeah, so in the beginning of like our fall season, which is our major season, um, we are given travel letters that we give to our professors. And for my experience, my professors have always been very accepting of my schedule, and they're willing to work with what I have to, like to do. Um, so that really helps on my end because that is a stressor that you you don't want to like embarrass yourself or m make yourself seem like you don't you're not going to work hard because you are gone so many days. So I think just that that relationship and going in after like you get back from travel trips and building that relationship with your professor and showing them that you're dedicated, I think also helps. Do you all feel like you have like cultural representatives like within your respective sports? So like say if you had a cultural issue that's not necessarily on the field, but you're like, who do I take this to? Do you feel like you guys have enough support in those things to have someone to go to or that it's a reliable resource to like actually want to take that to them? Or do you feel like you just sit on it and then handle it when you need to? Um, when you say cultural differences, what exactly do you mean by that? Like, um, like an example or something. So like say if there's like a racial tension issue or say if there's like a, um, oof, dear God, I am so tired. Say if there's either like a racial issue, like somebody says something or somebody does something, whether that's on the field with another team or with a like another peer on your team and you're just like, I don't like the way you talk that way. I, I don't wait. I don't appreciate how that situation was handled. Do you feel like you have someone who you're able to say, this situation has happened, whether that's someone um, being sexist or racist or just in general, something very insensitive and you're like, I could handle this myself, but it's much preferred if this is taken to somebody else. Do you feel like you have that person there like on your team rooting for you or do you feel like you kind of have to search for that? Yeah, well, speaking for football, um, Coach Campbell is zero tolerance with any sort of discrimination or anything in that manner. Um, and that, like I said, that's kind of the standard that us players, we hold each other accountable to. I think the unique thing with having, being on a football team, you have so many different people from so many different backgrounds. So it's, if it's a situation that I can't handle, then nine times out of 10, there's somebody on the team that can relate, that can handle that. And that takes the maturity of saying, you know what, this is outside of my realm or my comfort zone, so I'm gonna to go to this person. And I think we have multiple people on the team that are capable of doing that. And if we can't find that within the team first, then yeah, Campbell and Hill ultimately make the final decisions or say so or, you know, uh, consequences, so. I would say for me in terms of cultural differences, um, it's big for me, but like I said, I try to form relationship with people with, who has different ethnic backgrounds to kind of understand, you know, how they are and why they do certain things and all those things. Um, when it comes to my team, I try to be a leader. I'm not somebody who talk a lot. Um, I try to, you know, kind of set an example, basically. And so um, if somebody was to, you know, say something bad about somebody else or try to discriminate, um, I feel like it's up to everybody on, on the team to kind of like, you know, stand up and, you know, do what's right. And um, everybody on my team, you know, understands that, you know, when I'm around, everybody knows that. When I'm not around, everybody knows that. So I think 
it's just us being a leader. We hold each other accountable. Like, you know, Greg said, we hold each other accountable for everything that we do. So we got to set a good example, basically. So respecting everybody's time. Can we give our panelists another round of applause? <laughs>